Oh, that's so funny. We have this microphone because we are live streaming and recording this event. And I'm telling you that also so that you will use the microphone when it's time for questions. There will be time for questions. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. This event we called the midterm elections are over. What's next for America? <laughs> Dick Pullman here, the amazing Dick Pullman, um, pitched that title at a moment when we didn't know what last week would, would be like. So um, I, we still don't know. Yes, thank you, Richard. I, 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 th I think, though, we couldn't be in better hands um, than Dick Pullman for this conversation. Um, he's a political journalist that many of us read religiously and regularly. Um, he's been teaching at Penn since 2006, long time. Um, we've here benefited from extraordinary conversations that Dick has hosted with um, visiting journalists um, of all kinds, um, people who write profiles, um, long, form, uh, long form things, and also beat reporters, obituary writers, all kinds of people, but we also get to hear from Dick Pullman himself, which is just a real treat. And I can't imagine a better context to do it. And again, it feels much better today than <laughs> maybe three weeks ago, uh, personally, for me. I don't want to speak for all of you. Um, I bet you would. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that. However, I will not. Um, so what we're going to do today, um, um, Normally we'd be eating lunch. I just want to tell you there will be lunch. It's on the way. We'll have lunch afterward, um, probably around one o'clock is approximately yes. the goal. Um, the extraordinary Dick Pullman will give us uh, some some words, some thoughts about what has happened, where we are, what might happen. You'll predict the future. Um, but then we'll have a chance to ask questions. And for that, I hope you'll use the microphone so the people watching online will hear. Um, so without further ado, um, please help me welcome Dick Pullman. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. I know that uh, um, you have probably had many, many things you could be doing today right now. Uh, but perhaps since uh, for many of us or most of us here, uh, last Tuesday night actually was a uh, chance to put away the cyanide capsules. Um, I thought maybe that was perhaps one of the reasons you all wanted to come and, and be uh, together. Uh, so what I want to do is just basically talk um, conversationally as much as I can for, oh, I don't know, maybe a half an hour at the most, tax your patience, uh, and then open it up to questions. Uh, just about what we what we're witnessing, what we did witness last week, what we're still witnessing, and what we may witness in the next few years. Uh, my take on it, anyway. Um, and I was breaking it up into. I'm basically going to try to break this down into three three areas. Uh, the first one is in the, in this order: uh, Why were the polls so wrong, uh, and why did some, the mainstream media parrot the polls so much? Uh, number two is uh, is. Oh, I even I have to say the word is Trump over, uh, or uh, or is, is is Trump over and is Trumpism uh, um, living on, um, and uh, the third is of course uh, what's next, what we maybe can expect in the next few years, um, but I wanted to um, start with um, uh, you know why were the polls so wrong and why the media was parroting so many of them because I want to focus at least initially on on press coverage, uh, since this is obviously, this is a journalism and writing house that we are in. Um, so I wanted to start with that. And we'll start with some of what uh, many of us would consider to be the, uh, the good news uh, of, uh, that's come out of the midterms, uh, which is that uh, the Democrats unexpectedly or semi-unexpectedly uh, held the Senate. And uh, if the, the runoff race in Georgia goes the way it, uh, I think it will, uh, they will actually add a seat uh, for a 51-49 majority, which is actually uh, more sub uh, consequential than it sounds. It really means, if nothing else, that um, um, President Biden can continue to nominate and confirm federal judges, though that all gets done through the Senate, uh, to basically uh, dilute, at the very least, the, uh, uh, the judges uh, the, that um, uh, Donald Trump um, had confirmed 
uh, in his first few years. So uh, if nothing else, that the, uh, those confirmation hearings uh, will, will continue to go the Democrats' way. Um, we have a number of states where there's been amazing results. Uh, obviously, we have to mention, because the 5149 is, uh, breakdown is in part, of course, due to uh, the election of John Fetterman here in Pennsylvania. Uh, and um, uh, the election uh, overwhelmingly of a new Democratic governor, uh, the possible uh, turn of uh, one of the chambers in Harrisburg to the Democrats, uh, which is, you know, for the first time in, what, a decade at least. Uh, Michigan has an all-Democratic uh, 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 um, leadership, all women, by the way, uh, first all-Democratic leadership in Michigan in 40 years. Um, Arizona has a Democratic governor a, and two Democratic senators in Arizona. That hasn't happened in 70 years. Uh, so these are things that uh, a, a lot of us did not expect to happen. And the House is a very, very narrow, uh, very narrow, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later, a Republican majority. Uh, and the numbers are a little bit deceptive. I mean, it may be just by one seat or two, but typically speaking, there's vacancies a lot. Uh, people don't show up or they get sick or people pass away. Uh, so it's an extremely fragile uh, majority. And and uh, it's going to be, for the Republicans, it's going to be a very chaotic majority. And I'll get to that in a bit. Um, so anyway, what we were, nevertheless, what we were witnessing the last few weeks were, if, if we were reading and listening, uh, was uh, the polls seemed to overwhelmingly suggest that it was going to be something between a, uh, a red wave and a red tsunami. Uh, and um, I, there's, there are these brilliant uh, compilations uh, that I've seen on social media uh, cutting together uh, um, anchors and uh, talking heads on TV talking about red tsunamis and red waves and how big it was going to be. Um, and, uh, and, and it didn't happen. Uh, in fact, Joe Biden, as a uh, first-term president, this is actually one of the best first-term performances uh, in an off year for a Democratic president, at least since the 70s. Uh, Jimmy, uh, not um, uh, Bill Clinton lost something like 60 seats, uh, and so did uh, Obama in their first terms. Didn't happen this time. House seats didn't happen this time. So we have to ask ourselves why, but first we'll get to, you know, why were the polls so wrong? Um, I think one of the reasons is that they missed uh, a lot of what was going on. They missed, in particular, young voters. Um, and uh, part of the problem that the pollsters have had, and they never talk about this, and you don't see these in the stories that quote polls and start with their opening paragraphs talking about the polls, is that um, the response rate that they get when they make phone calls, either on landlines or cell lines, uh, most people don't pick up at all. And, I mean, I'm sure many of you are in that situation. If you get a call on your cell and you don't recognize it, you ignore it. Uh, and so that has become endemic, in, uh, and pollsters are really, really having a, a big problem with that. And young voters, I've seen some studies on this already post-election, young voters in particular, uh, young people in particular, are, are more, uh, I should say, maybe the word would be savvy or vigilant, uh, about not answering calls that they don't know. Uh, so uh, the polls were missing a lot of that particular action uh, uh, among voters, among people 18 to 29 years old. And as it turns out, uh, well, they voted overwhelmingly Democratic, which is not to be you know, surprised, but they voted overwhelmingly Democratic. And um, in the midterm elections, just for comparison's sake, there was uh, midterm elections in 2014, which sounds like a long time ago, uh, uh, young voters, only 20% of voters aged 18 to 29 showed up that year at the midterms, only 20%. This year, in the nine most competitive states, according to these new numbers crunching that I've seen, 31% of young people uh, showed up at the polls. And so I think a lot of that was missed by the pollsters. Um, the, uh, the other thing is that you read about uh, likely voters. I'm sure you saw a lot of stories. They'll say, well, X percent of likely voters say that uh, they're going to vote Republican or that uh, Republicans are going to take the Senate by these margins. Well, what are likely voters? The definition of likely voters that pollsters use is those are voters that have voted in the past. Uh, they have a history of voting. That's why they're most likely to vote. But what it misses is the new registrants. It misses the people who signed up. And this year, 
who signed up besides young voters, who signed up in the most fervent, passionate numbers? Uh, women. After the uh, overturning of Roe versus Wade, and we saw this repeatedly in elections that were handled over the summer. There was a Kansas rep in Kansas, Red Kansas, a referendum. The polls said it was going to be really close that whether uh, cho uh, choice was going to be thrown out of the Kansas Constitution. I think there was some language in there. Um, turned out it was a landslide for the choice position. And the, no and the new registrants among women were the ones who drove it. What happened with the Fetterman race here in Pennsylvania? Women voted for Fetterman by 15 points, 57% to 42%. And you have to, you know, I mean, there's no, you can't draw a direct line to this. But I have to believe, uh, based on, I guess, my instinct over the years, is that when Dr. Oz said during the debate, uh, that uh, uh, abortion should be a choice between women, a doctor, and local political leaders, uh, that that was uh, probably uh, more damaging than the fact that uh, John Fetterman, recovering from his stroke, uh, could not articulate as well as many, particularly in the punditocracy, uh, wanted him to. Uh, so I think those were some of the things that were missed by, by the polls. So why did the press, why did so many in the press, the mainstream press, uh, amplify uh, repeat, parrot, uh, those polls constantly, I saw them. Um, and I think there were basically, well, three reasons for that. And I guess I'm, I'm thinking here, I'm talking here as someone who has obviously been around, been around journalism for, you know, uh, I, uh, can I say this now? Um, <laughs> since 1973, um, number one, um, uh, a hunger for metrics political reporters, political journalists, you're hungry for metrics. You don't know. You want, you, you want to know what's going on. You want to know who's going to win. Um, how can you possibly measure that unless you look at some numbers somewhere? If people are polling, that's at least something you could possibly seize on because it's very hard to go out. And I've done stories like this in the past. It's very difficult to do where you're going out and you think you're getting a kind of an on-the-ground sampling of people in a swing area. And maybe you talk to 20 people and you think you're getting a representative sampling of the mood out there. But you, you don't know. It's very, very difficult to, to, to peg an entire narrative on something like that. So you look at numbers. You, you get hungry for numbers. So that's number one. Number two is that conventional wisdom and history tells journalists that uh, and this is true, that in most midterm elections, the uh, out party, in this case the Republicans, but that the out party typically gains a lot of seats uh, when the um, um, incumbent party has the, uh, the uh, other party has the presidency. So, you know, so you're always on the lookout for that. You figure, well, it's got to be Republican leaning anyway. Um, the third is that um, uh, people in journalism are, uh, and this every four years, they lament this, they, we lament this, and then it comes back and it happens again. You get addicted to the horse race. You know, who's up, who's down, who's going to win, who's not. Now, the one thing I would say as, an, uh, as a part of the reason for that, frankly, is that journalists often get asked by people. Uh, people want to know, you know, what do you think is going to happen? Who's going to win? You know, I gave two or three public talks the last few weeks to groups before the election, and, and that was always the first thing that during Q&A, you know, who do you think is going to win? What do you think is going to, they, you know, people want to know. Um, and so, you know, we're kind of um, um, maybe predisposed in that sense to want to try to understand, you know, to focus our attention just on who's up and who's down. Uh, and so you look to polls. So the biggest problem, well, there's another one too. Okay, so a lot of people in the press are, are uh, always fearful of being labeled as having, quote unquote, liberal bias. And so if the polls seem to indicate that the Republicans are gonna win, it's like, okay, well, we can say Republicans, see, we don't have liberal bias, we're saying the Republicans are gonna win. So there's that feeling of, you know, you don't wanna be caught by, you don't wanna be attacked by the other side. And we're already being attacked as so-called enemies of the people uh, by certain people in the MAGA movement. Um, so you tend to sort of, okay, if the Republicans seem to be ahead, you're going you're gonna to want to say that to people. Um, and there's one other thing, which is uh, that, um, uh, if I can find it on my, on my chart here. Yeah, here was the problem. This was the biggest problem. A lot of the polls were junk polls this year. An increasing number of polls were driven by and paid for partisan 
interests. Uh, and this was something that uh, has really gathered speed the last few cycles. What I mean by junk polls is, to me, like uh, the, um, uh, the gold standard for a poll, to me, is the NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, which comes out regularly. Uh, and it's conducted by a Republican pollster, a very well-established, respected Republican pollster, working in tandem with a well-respected Democratic pollster. They work together on the questions. They both vet the numbers. Uh, and um, I always pay attention to that poll the, more than any other. But there are a lot of them that, when I say junk polls, they're funded by, they've been funded by, or they are or owned by uh, people with a strong partisan persuasions, particularly on the right. And the best example I can think of is one called Trafalgar. Uh, there were a lot of, uh, I saw a story saying, according to the latest Trafalgar poll, uh, they all said that the Senate was going to go Republican by something like six or eight seats, uh, and that the House was going to be, you know, 30 or 40 seat margin for the Republicans, and that Dr. Oz was going to win, et cetera, et cetera, and, and Herschel, uh, Herschel Walker in Georgia was going to win. Um, the, the head of Trafalgar is a, is a longstanding Republican activist who spent half of the election cycle this year on, on Fox News uh, saying things, if I can find it here, bear with me for a second. Um, he was saying things about races such as that uh, 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 Herschel Walker had, uh, uh, was uh, cooking on all cylinders. Uh, Herschel Walker has really been a juggernaut in, in Georgia. Uh, you know, he was never really ahead in any of the polls except for some of these junk polls. But what ends up happening then is that some of the ostensibly respectable websites, like realclearpolitics.com is one, um, they take all the polls out there and then they average them. And so what they were doing is they were also averaging the junk polls into their numbers. And so they, RCP, as it's known for short, was predicting a, rep a red wave. And so, you know, journalists look at these sites, they see red wave, and so, so it gets amplified. So, um, uh, you know, I guess one of the problems that, that um, we as news consumers have is, you know, how much time in the day do we really have to to sort through all this and try to, you know, separate the wheat from the chaff. You know, it's really up to journalists to do that job. And so probably what's going to happen in the next few years, there'll be conferences of political reporters getting together and wringing their hands about what they did wrong and vowing to do better next time. Next time's only two years away, and two years away has already started, if, if anybody saw the announcement last night, which we'll get into in a second, as I'm sure you'd love to hear. Um, but here's, all right, so here's the last statistic I'm going to give you about polls, and I'm going to move on. Um, the New York Times, uh, you know, they try to do it. They try to do a good job. They, they work with a good polling firm. Um, and they did a story about how hard it is to go out and to, and, and to get good numbers out there. And this is one of their statistics that they had, that um, um, they dial up people. And take, if you can guess what the percentage, the people they dial up, what, the, what is the percentage of people who give them complete interviews that they can use in their poll? The, the percentage is 0.4% of the calls they make. And it takes them two hours to complete an interview with a person that they're using. So, you know, it's extremely labor intensive. It's, and it's, it's, you know, I don't know, it, it's not art. Maybe it's art more than science, but I'm not sure how, so, how much science is involved. So um, that brings us to last night and, and uh, Trump's announcement, or, or as somebody I saw on Twitter called it, uh, it's Groundhog Day in Hell. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know if anybody noticed, I, I don't know if anybody noticed this but, uh, or heard about this, but uh, he talked for so long that there were people who wanted to leave and they were they were they were near the they were massing near the exits, but the security people wouldn't let them leave the room. So uh, there's some kind of metaphor there, but it actually reminded me of some rock and roll lyrics from the Eagles' song "Hotel California," uh, which is uh, you know the last line is you know you can check in any time, but you can never leave. So um, you know the, so the question now is you know what do we what do we you know is is Trump is 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 this like just some kind of retread election um, a campaign is he is he doing it just you know because he thinks it's going to protect him from indictment yes um, it, it won't necessarily 
but um, you know, I guess really the question is, um, is Trump over? Uh, or maybe the better question is, even if he is over, what about Trumpism? Uh, is that over? That is not over. I think what's happening now among a lot of people in the Republican slash MAGA movement is that um, the only reason they're upset with him is because so many of his candidates lost last week. And, you know, they may be upset and fed up with um, him trying to re rerun the uh, 2020 election and the whole thing with not accepting results. Um, and I think they kind of feel that if that aspect of the chaos would just go away, they could then concentrate on a lot of the same things uh, that Republicans have always wanted to do, which is to uh, perhaps uh, sunset or privatize Social Security uh, and Medicare um, and, a lot, and, and cut taxes for, uh, for, for the affluent and all the stuff that was there before. So one of the things that propelled Trump was um, white grievance or the grievance among a subset of white people in this country. I don't know if that's necessarily going to just disappear even if he goes down, um, you know, it's just that that whole um, uh, the whole notion that uh, it all started with Trump is is a fallacy. Of course, I mean, you can go back, you could trace things back to Newt Gingrich in the 1990s, um, uh, Alex Jones, you know, who's now having to give up all of his money supposedly to the uh, to the Sandy Hook parents. Um, he predates Trump. I mean, uh, Rush Limbaugh, all the years, uh, the late Rush Limbaugh be, was predated Trump. So, uh, you know, all that stuff is not going to necessarily go away. I think they're looking for someone now without Trump's uh, perceived um, baggage. Uh, and I think, actually, Mitch McConnell, and I will quote, quote him approvingly for the moment, um, here's something he said the day, yesterday the day before, uh, and I agree with this. He said, quote, uh, we underperformed among independents and among moderates because their impression of many of our candidates uh, and our leadership is that we've been involved in chaos. And I think chaos, I think, is the key word. I think what a lot of voters were fed up with um, was just, you know, uh, just all this circus stuff that goes on, all the stuff with God, stop, you know, stop uh, denying what happened in 2020. It's over already. Um, and, and, you know, let's, let's try to move on. So, you know, um, uh, Trump last night talking for over an hour about all his greatest hits. Um, you know, I think there's, I mean, and it's clear there's a lot of Republicans who don't want that anymore. A lot of donors who gave money to him are saying, and I'll, I'll clean up the quote from one of them that I saw. He said, you know, I'm not going to give him another darn nickel. It was not darn that this person said. So there's just... Um, there's a, a real desire for them to, to just I can do what he's done and, and you know, attack uh, so-called woke culture and uh, et cetera and transgender, you know, uh, bathrooms and all those things that they've made culture of war issues. I think they still want to do that, but without Trump doing it. And, um, and they have a number of people who are certainly qualified, uh, <laughs> if that's the word, uh, to do that. So... And there's one other factor, of course. Um, uh, will he be indicted? I mentioned before, this is not going to protect him from indictment. This is still the great unknown. He is um, under threat of indictment in Washington uh, for um, uh, taking classified documents, which belong to the people. Uh, he's under uh, risk of indictment in Georgia. Uh, for tr for pressure, and it's all on phone call. It's all been ca captured on phone calls, uh, pressuring authorities down there to find him 11,000 votes so that he could overturn the uh, legal results in Georgia. Uh, and uh, the grand juries are sitting. So uh, this is not going to protect him from anything. So the question really is, uh, if he is indicted, uh, what uh, what happens then? What is the Republican base uh do uh obviously there's certainly a subset of the republican base that will do that will just think it's a you know a so-called deep state plot against them and it will change nothing about their behavior and there's a number of them now that it is changing nothing about their behavior a lot of the comments that are out there a lot of the emails that i get uh because my column is syndicated so i get all kinds of wonderful email from all around the country, uh, which I, I won't read to you now. Um, and and it's, a lot of it's come in since the election, and you'd never know 
that the results of the election were what they were if, if by listening or by reading what these people have to say. So, you know, they don't, that, that's kind of the way cults operate. You know, they'll just, they'll just, you know, find rationalizations for whatever, um, is in front of them. So, um, in, in fact, uh, I mean, I just forgot to mention this too. There was, um, I was uh, so upset this morning with some of the, um, media coverage of Trump's announcement uh, because it was like they'd some of some of the media outlets it's like they'd learned nothing the last six years uh, so they, they think that objectivity quote unquote is um, is just um, well I'll give you an example of objectivity all right this was the CNN uh, lead this morning the CNN uh, tweet uh, on his um, Oh, it's here somewhere. Excuse me. Um, the CNN tweet on his uh, announcement was, in its entirety, former President Donald Trump announces another run for the White House and enters the 2024 race, aiming to become only the second U.S. president ever elected to two non-consecutive terms. And my reaction was, wow, he's the potential next Grover Cleveland you know, I mean, that's all we can say. I mean, as if Trump could even name Grover Cleveland. But um, so I thought, you know, that was a little bit um, off base. And I think that, you know, what what some websites were better, some sites were the Washington Post, NPR. Uh, but I wrote one this morning on my on, um, on my on my column. I tried out what I consider to be in this environment and with everything we know, this is what is an objective lead to me. Accurate. Factual, you can't, not a single word of this is in dispute. Uh, Donald Trump, the twice impeached ex-president, whose last act in office was to incite a violent insurrection for the purpose of staying in power after being rejected by 7 million votes, comma, and who is currently at risk of being criminally indicted in Washington for allegedly stealing classified documents, comma, or in Georgia for pressuring officials to invent votes after the race was over, comma, has decided to run again, comma, defying pleas from many in his party that he stand down. So I don't, I don't know if I, if I was, I had a long career at the Philadelphia Inquirer. If, I don't know, if I wrote that, I don't know if that would all get in exactly the way I wrote it now, even today, uh, but that's, that's the beauty of having my own website, I have to say. Um, so, um, so that brings us really to number three. What, what's, what's next? And, and I'll do this for five minutes and then I'll uh, take your questions. Uh, you know, so if Trumpism is definitely going to be alive and well in the, um, the MAGA arm of the House Republican Party. Uh, you know, they've got this slim majority, uh, as I mentioned, and the speaker, Kevin McCarthy, or the likely speaker, Kevin McCarthy, his, his life's going to be hell for the next two years. Uh, you know, I, I often tell my students, uh, guard against having too much certitude and, and, and being too confident in your, in your predictions because you never know what's going to happen in politics. But I would say that what I'm about to say is an exception to that general rule. Uh, when, when the Republicans have only like a one, two or three seat margin in the House, what it means is that uh, the, the MAGA arm of the House Republican caucus is going to be um, in full performance art mode. And they're going to be, you know, they're, they're going to want to launch investigations of their own. You know, I mean, they might as well just give Hunter Biden a reserved parking space next to the Capitol building, you know, because they're going to be plumbing everything but his DNA for the next two years, you know. So thinking that basically his laptop is going to, you know, um, Trump, as it were, everything that uh, that the MAGA people have done the last few years. Uh, we could even see an investigation in the House, if you want to call that, of the soon-to-be-retiring Dr. Fauci, whose uh, you know whose main crime seems to be saving lives in the last few years. Um, I think the, uh, the the Department of Homeland Security um, um, chief, whose name is uh, Alejandro, Alejandro uh, Mayorkas, um, is probably going to get uh, hauled in to talk about the border. And border security. So you know they're going to they're going to have their soapboxes, and it's going to make a lot of noise. Um, whether it's going to amount to anything beyond that, 
uh, to me is doubtful. You know, they'll play to their base. They'll keep them ginned up, but it won't, it can't result in anything substantive in terms of legislation because the Senate is still democratic. The Senate will block it if there's any legislation. Uh, and uh, the president, even if it got to Biden, Biden has the veto pen. So there's not much that the House can do in terms of substantive legislation. They can't do things like, I don't know, uh, outlaw gay marriage or something, because as a matter of fact, I think gay marriage is actually going to, a, a protection for it, a federal protection is actually going to pass uh, because the Senate actually has a bipartisan um, um, 60 vote margin now that they can pass that uh, between now and January when the new con- the new Congress comes in. Um, so there won't be any meaningful legislation out of the House. There'll be just tons of circus stuff uh, that is extremely distracting uh, for many of us. But of course, that's also great. That's also great catnip for the press to write about. Uh, and, you know, you'll probably see two versions of it. You know, if you look at Fox News, uh, it'll be emblazoned there. And if you look at MSNBC, they'll be talking about it as, oh, my God, you're not going to believe what these people are doing now. Uh, but, uh, you know, whether anything real comes out of any of that, uh, I don't know. The, pr- the, the bottom line, unfortunately, uh, is that um, certain things that we would like that we, at least progressives, uh, and most Americans, and according to the polls, I should say, would like to see, such as a nationally codified legalization of abortion. Um, that's not going to pass the House now, I can't imagine, uh, unless there are a number of vacancies and the House switches uh, over and becomes Democratic again, which could happen. You know, there's just, you don't know. It's just when they have that kind of margin, as I said before, uh, it's very tenuous. So something like that uh, could come into play. Um, I remember after George W. Bush was elected in, in, um, w- with the help of the Supreme Court in, at the end of 2000, uh, and he had a, he had a, a Republican Senate uh, for like six months. And then the, the uh, Republican uh, senator from Vermont, whose name was Jim Jeffords, switched parties. And presto, it became a Democratic Senate. So there's any number of things that could happen um, with the House. I guess if there's one good thing... Um, First of all, I should also say, in terms of um, chaos from the um, uh, from the right wing caucus in the House, it's nothing new. Um, those of us who've been following politics and writing about it for a long time, we well remember that uh, it's what drove. Uh, remember, there was a speaker named John Boehner. It drove him so crazy he quit the House. Uh, Paul Ryan, his successor, uh, you know, just left the House and became I don't know cashed in somehow he couldn't take that anymore and you know mccarthy is arguably they say less skilled than either of those two first two gentlemen um so you know they've been doing this for a long time um i'll read your quote this is a quote from like 10 years ago from a um it was a former new york times guy who became kind of a public interest advocate and he said referring to the right-wing caucus people from safe districts from red districts. He says, uh, with protected monopolies of support back home, uh, they take little or no political risk for adapting extremist positions that bring Congress to a halt. Um, And so we're going to see those same kinds of games again, unfortunately. Uh, The upside, such as it is perhaps for the Democrats, is um, that they can play off that in 2024 and say we had a do nothing house they got nothing done they don't know how to govern um you know they haven't had answers for how we cure inflation even though they talked about it all the way through the midterms uh they don't have any answers about how to you know how to save social security because they want to privatize it uh they've always said they wanted to get rid of obamacare they've never had a plan to do that they still don't you know so i can see them democrats playing off these republican failures, if I can call them, uh, for the next few years. So, um, and if, and if there's an upside, at least from this election for, uh, the voters who, who gave us what they gave us and many of them in this room, I presume, um, helped in that, in that regard, uh, is that I, I, I call them the, um, uh, the exhausted majority and I consider us exhausted uh, by you know like this all this chaos for so many years, and I think we're exhausted by it to the point where we basically said, you know, enough already. You know, let's 
let's let's try to put the some of the adults in charge. Let's get a lot of these nutty candidates like Herschel Walker and Oz and Carrie Lake in in Arizona as the the gubernatorial candidate and Blake Masters in Arizona. Let's you know let's let's keep these people out of office. Let's keep all the these Secretary of State candidates who are already vowing to like fix the 2024 election in all the swing states. Let's defeat every single one of them, which happened. Uh, and so, you know, it gives us hope. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, we did, we dodged another bullet and, and democracy, uh, um, uh, and what we love about this country is still in play. So anyway, that's what I was working up all morning, but, uh, <laughs> um, I will take, I will take questions. I believe is there is there is going to be a microphone. Yeah. I believe someplace. Yes, we have a microphone. So, um, if anybody has a question that uh, hopefully I won't whiff on, um, but I'll hold my breath on that. And then there are a few questions I anticipate, and if I don't hear them, I will give you the answers that I was going to. They have already prepared. Thank you, Dick. That was great. Um, I, a slightly different perspective on the difference between the polls. I don't think the polls were that inaccurate. I think it was the interpretation by the pundits, by the analysts who got it wrong. The polls were not that far off. If you look at the margin of error, they were pretty close in Pennsylvania, in Arizona, in uh, most of the swing states. They were relatively close, but the analysts misinterpreted the data, and they saw a wave that didn't happen. Um, that, that was point number one. The second one is, with Trump, we all want to write him off. Um, but just like in 2016 when he ran then, he doesn't need a majority of the party to get the nomination. What he did was he had his solid 35, 38, 40 percent in primaries, and that was enough to win all of the primaries. And he could do the same strategy again if there's a large field running against him. Uh, okay. All right. Is there going to be a call? So I'll make a question for that. Is there going to be, can that happen again? Is there a large field running against him? Yeah. What happened last time, of course, you may remember there was seven or eight or ten, I can't remember, it was a crowded stage, it was like as many, like Hollywood squares, there were so many people up there. Um, I don't know, um, you know, we don't know yet what's going, I mean, obviously I think Ron DeSantis in Florida is, is gearing up, um, and, and Trump's already paranoid about him, and has said, said indicated as much in, the, in his, tw in his uh, social media texts, um, but, uh, you know, I think part of the problem is that I think now, um, he has a tr the difference now. I think is that he has a track record, uh, and what I was saying before is that a lot of people uh, who were uh, with him last time, uh, including his own daughter uh, uh, and, and brother and uh, son-in-law, they've already uh, you know they've already aced out of the thing. Uh, um, there were uh, last night. I was interested in in the fact that uh, I don't believe a single member of the Re of Republicans in Congress went down there. Uh, Matt uh, Matt Gates, uh, one of his uh, chief fanboys, uh, said that uh, he didn't think that the weather was going to be good for flying, and it turned out it was beautiful, clear, temperate night in South Florida. So, um, I, you know, I think he's got a lot less support than he than he had before. Um, I think a lot of people in, voted for him in 2016 uh, on the Republican side because, you know, it, you know they wanted to um, uh, they wanted to send a message, um, you know, they wanted to shake things up, uh, quote unquote, to to quote a friend of mine who voted for him in the Republican Massachusetts primary, uh, and I think now they've seen what he produced, so um, I don't know if he can. Uh, I don't know if he can pull off the same thing again, particularly when um, there's a lot of people now who just won't give money to him. Um, so he's going to be relying on a lot of a lot of small donations, uh, and whether that's going to be enough um, is to me to me problematical. Then again, um, I said he was going to lose to Hillary Clinton in 2016, so as did <laughs> virtually everybody else. Um, so, but I you know I just think he's I think he's a wounded beast this time. And uh, uh, I really do believe that if there's any kind of legal action against him, uh, that, um, you know, uh, it's going to, you know, it's not going to be like Boston one time uh, reelected a mayor who was in prison. 
Uh, this was like 100 years ago or so. Uh, I don't really see the same kind of thing happening um, at the national level. And the whole notion that, oh, he's a businessman, he's going to run America like a business, which was another thing people said, a successful businessman. A lot of people said that in 2016. Well, right now there's a criminal trial uh, in New York involving his company. Uh, and there's going to be they're going to take the company away from him and they're going to have some kind of special master or something administer the company. Uh, and, you know, I think I think that stuff sinks in after a while. Here's the mic. Sorry. What do you think is going to happen with the uh, January 6th hearing? Well, I think we can. Uh, it, it, I th <laughs> the January sixth hearings are are over, uh, and uh, I think they concluded them with the full anticipation that the House was going to go Republican, and so um, they're they're done. There won't be any more hearings. However, uh, the old Congress is still operating until the new one is sworn in in uh, early next year, and so there will be a final report uh, pulling together. Um, everything that uh, they have uh, um, given us already in great abundance uh, with a massive preponderance of the evidence. Uh, and uh, whether that's going to, you know, change any more minds. I mean, the election's over. Uh, I don't know how much January 6th um, uh, impacted anyone's vote uh, in, in the midterms. Uh, but, um, you know, my guess would be that you know, it, that it sunk in subliminally with all the other stuff that people were just fed up with hearing about, you know, in terms of replaying the 2020 election. Uh, so uh, we're not going to see uh, any more hearings from that. And Lynn Cheney, uh, Lynn Cheney of course, is leaving Congress uh, after her defeat. Um, what we may be hearing, though, from someone like her uh, is uh, I can see her having uh, some kind of very uh, prominent megaphone going forward. Um, she's been speaking out anyway um, and uh, 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 reminding Republicans, at least those who are gettable, uh, that, uh, in her words, uh, President Trump should uh, never be president again. I, I think you had a... And then we'll go back. Hi. You, social media is a very big thing now, particularly with young people. Can you tell me what you perceive Congress and the government getting involved in ensuring the security and validity of social media? The security and validity of social media. First of all, I mean, well, first of all, the validity is sort of in the eyes of the, of, of the beholders. I mean, social media to me is, and I, I use Twitter, even with Elon Musk in charge. I don't know how long that's going to go on. But to me, Twitter is something that is... Uh, uh, it's only as good or as bad as you want it to be. You know, you, you can follow good people or you can, you know, let yourself be dragged down the rabbit hole of, of lunacy. Uh, and I, I think, um, you know, Congress, I think, is rightfully um, wary uh, of uh, stepping in in any way to uh, regulate something which is arguably a First Amendment right. Uh, in the uh, free marketplace of ideas, as shoddy as some of the market goods are sometimes. So that's, that's as much as I really feel I can say about that. Um, yes, back there. Yes. With a uh, diminishing percentage of the electorate, uh, are there any new techniques that you think the Republican Party uh, at the local levels, I would imagine, you know, might uh, pursue to de destroy the uh, voting process in a democracy. <laughs> well, one of the things that, uh, that's been happening uh, is they have been concentrating uh, on local, local, local. Uh, you know, Tip O'Neill, was pro, was the Speaker of the House for many years, for Democratic famous Speaker of the House, once said that uh, all politics is local. Um, and... That's something actually that Republicans have been very good at and Democrats less good at, which is uh, seeding the grassroots. Uh, and you see it with school boards, for example, uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, poll workers and things like, you know, we didn't have a lot of the scary things happen, thank God, this time that we a lot of us have been fearing. Um, but 
you know, uh, what what Republicans doing, particularly sort of um, MAGA uh, Republicans, uh, is um, um, they're just trying to grow their base. They're not necessarily trying to reach out to um, people in the middle, much less Democrats, of course. Uh, they're trying to just grow their own. They're trying to grow their own base so that uh, they'll have a sufficient percentage of the electorate that they can, you know, um, get to sort of take over certain pivot points in the in the uh, in the process. And so um, uh, the electoral process at the local level is is uh, a primary target area. Uh, and if if Democrats, progressives, whatever you want to call, are smart, um, they will uh, increase their efforts to contest uh MAGA Republicans at the local level because, um, you know, there was um, uh, there was an example, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago where uh, evangelical Christian groups uh, were were really doing really, really well at grassroots levels, particularly school boards, education, and it still goes on in a number of states uh, because they were filling a vacuum. Nobody else was bothering to show up. Uh, so, you know, progressives and Democrats have to show up uh, at the local level with the same, uh, you know, with the same passion, basically. And, you know, if the midterm elections give Democrats any kind of um, encouragement, uh, they will want to act on that potential momentum to say, look, we, we actually do have people listening to us. We don't have to be defensive. We don't have to curl into a fetal position uh, and, and, and take the Republican frame on things. We can push back with a counter narrative of our own. One of the issues I think that hit the exhausted majority is campaign finance. Is there any taste at all for <laughs> fixing some of this? Well, I saw some heads shaking already. Uh, is there any is there any chance at all fixing some of it? Meaning the 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 endless amounts of money pouring into the um, not after what the not unless there's a huge Supreme Court um, overhaul of uh, uh, well, you know they 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 uh, they always said that they respect precedent. And then they overhauled Roe versus Wade. So, um, you know, can a future Supreme Court uh, uh, ignore precedent and overhaul the Citizens United ruling uh, uh, a number of years ago now when Obama was president, which basically opened the floodgates uh, for un unlimited spending, corporate spending, et cetera. Um, and it was basically with the, um, uh, with the spirit of you know, that this is free expression, uh, uh, a form of the First Amendment, that, uh, you know, if you're giving money, that's a form of speech, and uh, we can't uh, limit it. So all the regulations, you know, John McCain, uh, for example, was a big advocate of, uh, of cutting, um, of curbing unlimited spending. Um, but that's all gone now. And so, you know, until, unless and until the Supreme Court, for example, has a completely different composition, and, and many of us... Uh, May, may, many of us may not live that long. Um, I can't. I can't see it happening. And and I, I, let me just add one other thing quickly about the Supreme Court. One of the things that Republicans have been very smart at about uh, over the years is that they have prioritized the composition of the Supreme Court as an election issue. Democrats never did that with the same amount of attention, and we've suffered the consequences. You know, I mentioned for some reason, the long-forgotten 2014 midterm elections, uh, when hardly any Democrats bothered to show up at the polls, at least relative to the Republican turnout. What happened was the, Repo the, the, the uh, Republicans took the Senate. McConnell became um, uh, um, House of, uh, excuse me, Senate Majority Leader. Um, and, uh, and that led to um, holding up uh, uh, Merrick Garland's nomination in 2016, and all that came later. And so, uh, you know, we, we can say that, uh, you know, oh, those Republicans, look what they did to the Supreme Court. Uh, but it takes two to make it happen. And, uh, you know, it's Democratic inattention, uh, voting inattention in off-year elections, which helped give us the Senate, which then helped compose the court to what it is today, a 6-3 conservative majority. And so the idea of overturning uh, the, um, you know, uh, Citizens United or any of these uh, money-friendly rulings uh, is way down the road, I'm afraid to say. So what do you do then? So you have to play the game that you've got. And um, uh, I have to say um, that um, 
this particular election, Democrats did not have any trouble raising money. And, uh, I mean, Herschel Walker has been very vastly outspent in Georgia. Of course, he still, you know, got <laughs> two million people still voted for him anyway. But he was, out, he was you know, vastly outspent. Uh, you know, Dr. Oz had to put a ton of his own money in in Pennsylvania. Uh, um, and I, I mentioned before about these Secretary of State candidates and all the swing states and all the election deniers were beaten. Well, the Democrats, uh, from ground zero, built up a... And op- they paid attention to that, and they built up an operation that was just going to be uh, targeting those sec- Secretary of State campaigns, which they'd never really done before. And they raised a ton of money in a very, very quick amount of time using the same lack of rules or lack of regulations, I guess you can say, that Republicans have um, uh, taken advantage of. So, you know, so two can play the game. So you you have to deal with what you've got. Um, I think... You had a question, I believe. Uh, to go back to polling for a bit. Uh, so, I mean, I'm kind of of the side that the polls weren't all that inaccurate, but still, what would you say are the ways that you think journalists could maybe replace their desire for numbers with something other than polls? Or do you think that they just have to ditch a desire for numbers completely? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I guess one example would be one one thing would be just to uh, um, go to the most um, to the most respected, credible polls only, and to explain in their stories to the reader, you know, rather than just saying, "Oh, it has a margin of error of five percent," maybe talk a little bit more about why those why those particular co- polls are credible. You know, I mentioned NBC News, Wall Street Journal. Tell the readers, you know, that they are conducted by a Republican working with a Democratic pollster and that they both vet the same numbers. Uh, so that would be one thing. Um, um, another possibility is, um, and, and these are tricky, but, uh, and I know they have a bad rep, f- uh, focus groups. Um, you know, it's possible, uh, it is possible to to put together, you know, maybe in swing states, go and make sure, you know, and vet the people and make sure you're getting... Um, um, some kind of representative sampling of people uh, and, and, and listening to the subtleties, if they are subtle, sometimes they're not, uh, <laughs> of their opinions and how maybe they've, ch- how they're changing the opinions or how they shade their opinions, things that polls can't, pe- the numbers can't pick up shadings of opinion. And people have very, and I, I, all the years that I was, when I was interviewing voters, I'd see this all the time. You know, they, they'd have all kinds of shadings in what they had to say. And sometimes things that would seem to be contradictory. Uh, and then they would somehow you know, work their way to, through a verdict uh, based on even their con- contradictions. So I guess what I'm saying is that focus groups can still be valuable. Um, and I don't know if, you know, uh, enough news organizations, I guess the leading news organizations have the money. Uh, to do that, but you know the average uh, the average newspaper these days barely has enough to pay their their own staff. Uh, but anyway, that would be another example. I mean, I tried to do that. I forget which campaign it was. It was a, it was a Clinton campaign, um, and I mentioned this before. Uh, my whole my whole um, um, mission that year uh, handed to me was to go to uh, key bellwether uh, counties in key bellwether states and try to interview a, sa- a, a sufficient sampling of people uh, uh, who were, for example, um, Republican voters in the 80s. Uh, how were they feeling now in 1992 this was? And a number of them were saying, oh, you know, Bill Clinton interests me for any number of reasons. And, uh, you know, I, I felt that a lot of the pieces actually did work out because I was getting, I, the shadings were kind of suggesting that uh, George H.W. Bush might not win re-election. Um, so, so it can be done. It's just, it's a lot harder than just going to the next set of numbers that, you know, um, crosses your screen. Um, over here, you, you pick and then we'll work our way to the front and, and then we'll let you guys go. In your opinion, uh, to what degree does bad historiography on the part of journalists contribute to, uh, you know, a a nonsensical mainstream narrative? Um, Can I um, ask you to explain what you mean by historiography? Basically, people's conception of what 
the historical narrative actually is? Well, the narrative is, um, you know, if we're talking about the midterms, I mentioned before that um, you are, uh, journalists do look at the patterns of the past, and the patterns of the past can often inform what's happening now. I mean, I tell students all the time that um, try to, um, you know, contextualize with some historical perspective uh, whenever possible, because things are not brand new now and have no antecedents. Everything has antecedents. And so when you find out that there have only been two or three examples through all of the last hundred years that um, the party in power has kept the House and or Senate in the first midterm, um, you know, it kind of behooves you to pay attention to something like that. Uh, but, but at the same time, you know, you, you have to try to be open to new conditions and you can't be you can't be captured uh, by what happened in the past. And I guess this time we were, many of us were captured by the past too much. I don't know if that answers your question. No, I don't think it does. Thank you. Okay. So we have time right up here. And, and then if you don't ask the question that I've been anticipating, I will tell you the answer of <laughs> when we'll end with that. Thank you for a very illuminating talk. I will not ask about Ron DeSantis. Instead, I'd like to ask you about what is going on with Mitch McConnell, Donald Trump, and a quest for power in the Senate. Is this a diversionary thing, or does he really think there's something to be gotten out of that? Uh, who's he in this case? Donald Trump. D Trump, yeah. Well, I think, you know, I, I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, Trump is always... Um, uh, he refers to McConnell as Old Crow. Um, you know, he's got a nickname for everybody, right? So he keeps calling him Old Crow. And I guess what, what he's trying to do is he wants to destabilize McConnell because uh, he uh, he's very upset that McConnell attacked him uh, for the January 6th insurrection. McConnell was, uh, you know, McConnell still didn't vote to convict him, um, uh, which is a whole other subject. But, you know, the fact that he criticized uh, uh, Trump at all, uh, Trump remembers, uh, of course, everything. And uh, so um, uh, I think what he wants to do is uh, he wants to destabilize him for that. And he wants to, of course, shift the blame uh, for what happened in the uh, 2022 election. A lot of the people that uh, Trump cleared the way for, Oz might not have gotten the uh, endorsement in Pennsylvania if not for Trump, for instance. Um, he wants to shift the blame for what happened uh, for the uh, that for what happened that the Democrats still kept the, the chamber. So I, I think he would like to um, have someone there who Trump would like someone there who who he felt was um, uh, marching to his tune and doing his bidding. Uh, he has been challenged by um, uh, McConnell has been challenged for the leadership by Rick Scott, the Florida senator. Uh, and that's kind of interesting because Rick Scott was the, the leader of the um, Senate campaign committee in 2022 that ended up saddling the, its, its defeat. So uh, I don't know if, uh, if, uh, if, if Scott can beat him, but Scott is obviously much more sort of uh, Trump-centric at this point than McConnell. So, you know, a lot of it's just a real, a lot of it's a real grudge match. Um, what, what Trump does not seem to appreciate, however, well, there's a lot of things, of course, but one of the things he really doesn't appreciate is that if it was not for McConnell and McConnell's allies in the Senate who twice exonerated him in two impeachment trials, uh, he would not have, <laughs> he would, he would have probably, he would, his, uh, administration would have been cut short. And if I'm not mistaken, I think if you're convicted by the Senate, uh, I don't even think you're arguably qualified to run for president again. And there's a constitutional amendment where there's some language that people, uh, legal scholars point to. Uh, so um, I, don't, I don't think he's showing enough uh, gratitude to old Crow is, is the problem. But, uh, you know, then again, that's, these are kinds of the next two years are going to be um, um, a Republican uh, with, with, with um, apologies to cats. It's going to be a Republican cat fight like we've never seen. So um, I don't know, you know, we, we would like to be amused, I suppose, if we, can, uh, we, if we can mix being amused and appalled in some kind of uh, heady brew, then, that, then, that's, then that's what we should be. So um, I'll finish up by just um, answering a question I was expecting to get, which is, um, should Joe Biden run again in 2024? Um, see, um, 
<laughs> and um, I personally, my personal opinion is that I'm completely split because um, I, um, I respect what he's managed to do with two incredibly thin majorities. <coughs> and I don't know, I can't think of any other president with two incredibly thin majorities on Capitol Hill who's been able to get a lot of the stuff through that he has gotten. Uh, you know, the COVID relief, the infrastructure, uh, you know, making computer chips at home instead of in China. I mean, there, there's any number of things we could point to. Um, help for veterans. Uh, so, you know, I think that's been pretty uh, uh, impressive uh, on its own merits. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, he'll, he, he'll, be in his, um, he'll be in his early 80s. And uh, uh, not that 80 can't be the new 70, you know, in our, in, with our medical uh, condition. But you can, you, can, you can see, you know, you can see he's slowing down a bit. I mean, which is, you know, no shame in that. He, he, you know, imagine doing that job um, at, at that age. Uh, and uh, so, so that, kind of, that kind of gives me pause, particularly when I remember that he said in the 2020 campaign that he considered himself, quote unquote, a bridge uh, to the next generation of Democratic leaders. And one thing this election has done is given us potentially, given Democrats potentially a deeper bench uh, of potential next generation leaders. So, uh, you know, we all know the same names. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I was, I was interested in the, the governor of uh, Michigan and what, you know, surviving a kidnapping attempt and winning by 11 or 12 points and sweeping the, the party into power in a, in a Rust Belt Midwestern state. I mean, that's something, be, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, it'd be great if uh, the party was able to sort of uh, not be so West Coast, East Coast. Uh, so um, uh, people like the new, um, I, and I think, I think young voters, uh, I mean, you know, I, I hate to say this, but optics matter in politics, cosmetics matter in politics. And I think particularly when 18 to 29 year olds look at Biden, they see a very old person and, uh, you know, fairly or not. Um, and I think for the next election, they might connect better, uh, in great numbers to, to someone who was going to turn the page. Uh, for the Democrats. So, so I can see it going either way. I think if they had been, if there had indeed been a white tsunami, as many people had, we'd predicted, um, and uh, there were really humiliating losses in both houses, uh, I, I, I think Biden might actually, you know, be more inclined or some of the people around be more inclined to say, oh, we got to move on. Uh, but I think he might very well be now emboldened by, by what's happened that you know, is that his message worked. He talked about democracy being on the ballot. A lot of people laughed at him for that. Uh, I think a lot of people took that into account, the exhausted majority. So on behalf of the exhausted majority, thank you all for being here. <laughs> I have nothing left to say. And there's, and there's food. <laughs>